Welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. If you are trying to evaluate whether real estate is the right career for you, wondering whether you are doing the right things to launch into quick success, or looking for tips and tools you can use today to become a more productive agent, this is your podcast. Welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. This is season five, Success Stories, and I am so excited to have a special success story guest with us here today, Anne Robertson. And Anne is near and dear to my heart because she is one of our very experienced agent mentors here at The List Realty. So we get today to have Anne on the show to tell you about how she became successful how she became a mentor, and how she has successfully transitioned her business over the years. So Anne, welcome. Thank you so much, Meredith. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. All right, so let's get started with letting um, our audience know a little bit about you. How many years have you been in real estate? I've been in real estate since March of 2015. Um, I started off being licensed in Virginia, then D.C., then Maryland. Um, So... Yeah, going on nine years. Okay. So I want to ask you first about that multi-jurisdictional business that you run, because that's tricky. And I think, you know, there are a lot of parts of the country that are kind of isolated in their jurisdictions. We're one of the few, I think, where people go over state lines a lot. And we have that other real weirdness, which is that DC is not technically a state and has its own set of interesting rules and regulations that are significantly different from Maryland and Virginia's. So what what made you decide to branch out from Virginia originally to another jurisdiction? Well, I was actually living in D.C. when I was licensed Uh in Virginia first. However, I have lived in all three jurisdictions. When I moved to the area in 2004, I was living in Virginia first, uh, then got married and lived on Capitol Hill since 2005. So um, so. I started in Virginia because they were the only jurisdiction that had an online class. Oh, and really? Yes, at the, at the time wow. in 2015. So I was planning on doing the national exam and, and the Virginia exam um, online so that I could move then to DC. So I quickly became licensed in DC after Virginia for the purpose of working in DC and Virginia. So I did both. Um, And then a year later did Maryland. Okay. So just a year later, about a year later. Wow. Okay. Okay. And did you find that branching out that way enabled you to serve clients who were looking in all those areas or did it feel like you were running all over the place? I know I felt like uh, there was a lot of movement. There is a lot of movement between D.C., Maryland and Virginia, people moving out of D.C. into Virginia or Virginia into D.C. So uh, and Maryland. So I I just felt like it was necessary because Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to service the, the full service of all my clients. And if I didn't have the license in all three jurisdictions, I didn't feel like I could serve them fully. Mm -hmm. Um, Being able to manage the transaction on um, the selling and buying um, for a seller who's moving to a new place and buying, it can be a little tricky and and it really helps when the the agent can coordinate that and help them manage that and know the rules of, of both jurisdictions as well. Right, exactly. How difficult was it getting those additional licenses? Not that difficult. Um, Virginia is actually quite, it's it's an easier exam in the sense that it's a buyer beware state. Mm-hmm. So there aren't as many uh, rules around selling a property in Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, buying a property, on the other hand, you have to be very skilled mm-hmm. to know how to get the information that you need for your client to mm-hmm. best represent them. Um, so I did feel like Virginia was tricky on the one hand, but um, on the other hand, easier. Okay. Um, DC uh, is is complicated. Um, and kind of the opposite. It's of the that, opposite. Right? Yeah. The seller has the obligation to disclose every defect um, that they have, as well as Maryland. Um, the seller obligated is obligated to disclose all of that information. Um, and the buyer if they're dealing with the disclosed information, they need to know how to navigate. What do I do? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, you're talking about hundred year old homes and 
you know, complicated uh, tenant laws and yeah. tenant restrictions as well. Right. So um, DC is complicated, but it, it really felt uh, home to me. So it was very easy and um, somewhat um, comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So DC felt like home to you and you said you were like mm-hmm. in the Capitol Hill area, yes, I lived in the Capitol which area. sounds really cool and is really cool for it people is. who are listening. And whether you know this area or not, I mean, that's like what people think of sort of when they think of DC yes. is Capitol Hill. So coming onto the scene as a new agent, was there any level of like intimidation for you? Or are you like, no, this is my home. I know what I'm doing. Oh, absolutely. Um, I would say that the biggest intimidation was navigating the contracts because mm-hmm. every contract is different in, in the jurisdictions. Although yeah. Maryland in Montgomery County, it's the same contract more or less as DC with some dish, additional forms. Mm-hmm. I would say that the biggest intimidation part was the, the contracts and, okay. and knowing how to navigate the contracts, which um, they don't really teach you in the in the real estate classes. So. No, one of the many things that we don't really learn right. <laughs> in the, the pre licensing class. We do learn some some things that we will use, but for those yes. who have been through it, you know that you're going to learn almost everything you need to know to be successful in practice and with practice. experience. Yes. Um, so the funny thing is, some of my first three transactions were my own transactions. Oh, seriously? So, yes. So oh, I actually, I and I was happy because I I was able to navigate. Yes those transactions myself yeah, <laughs> and, and make mistakes, you know, right. with myself versus someone else. You because were your guinea pig. I yeah. was my own guinea pig. So for example, I did a 10, 1031 exchange oh my on an investment property and, and I was, I was a tenant myself. Uh, so okay. it was also navigating the tenant laws yeah. and everything and then purchasing a home as well. That was, um, yeah, it was all. So you started with like a really advanced one, the 1031 yes, tax to I, I like to jump in feet first <laughs> and like trial by fire, everything. So I really learned everything really fast. Wow. So, wow. That's a good way yes. to do it. Well, no wonder you're, you're flourishing as a mentor and what you're doing because you've, you've done it and you've learned it and you understand the, the intricacies. Okay. All right. So you're working in all three jurisdictions, living in Capitol Hill, um, buying and selling for yourself and renting for yourself. Yes. What's the next milestone for you? Well, finding the right brokerage is, is a challenge. It's always kind of um, finding a, a, a place to hang your hat. Yeah. Um, a place where you can feel a part of a team but all, and supported, but also able to individually seek out your modes of success. Yeah. And on Capitol Hill in DC in particular, there are a lot of established agents who who do very well and they they have a name and they have a, a place. Mm-hmm. And of course me entering into the into the to the mix of the business of mm-hmm. real estate on Capitol Hill, it, it, that was intimidating. Yeah. If you to, to be honest. But um from 2005 to 2017 I actually was um, working as a coordinator for Au Pair in America. I was a mm, Au Pair coordinator. Interesting. Um, so I would interview families and I would um, support Au Pairs throughout their stay. And part of that process was interviewing the families, going to the home, mm. and talking to the the families and uh, getting to know them, and also inspecting somewhat their space and mm. the home. Um, and I loved seeing all the homes and I would really enjoy meeting the families and talking with them. And, um, but the homes were very also, all the homes in, in DC are very unique. Somewhat. Yeah. So row houses may look the same on the outside, but they're very different and unique usually on the yeah. inside. Yeah. So I enjoyed that part very much. Yeah. And I, and that's, I would say that's one of the reasons why I felt like I could transition into a real estate um, role because one, the customer service element of working with families, Mm -hmm. I had established myself with a number of families Mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill. I grew from, um, I started with 11 families in the au pair um, company on Capitol Hill. And then I moved, I, by the time I left, or 200 or something. Wow, was, that's huge. Yeah. Growth. And I was 
working in all three juris jurisdictions, meaning mm -hmm. Southeast, Northeast, Northwest, and um, Southwest. Mm -hmm. So I was working in all, and then I eventually pared it down to just um, Northeast. Okay. So um, anyway, I, I was able to really get to know how to work with people, how to navigate, how to mediate. I mm -hmm. did a lot of mediations with au pairs and their families. Really? Yes. And I learned you mediation. Know that that part. Yes. Wow. Mediation, negotiation, if you want to call it. So um, I really learned kind of that art of um, helping and listening. Yeah. A lot of it had to do with listening. Yeah. So, but I really enjoyed seeing all the homes. So you kind of got it all. You got the homes, you got the interaction with the people. Yes. And I feel like you were probably also establishing yourself kind of as like an authority figure amongst some of those people because Correct. you were being selective about how placements were made and doing some of like you said the, the mediating as well using Correct. really great communicative and learning those people skills Correct. going into it. That I can imagine bode, bodes you very well for getting yes. into success as, as a real estate agent right yes. after that. And in a way, you know, there's a contractual relationship between the au pair and the family. Mm. I was also helping navigate that contract in a way. Um, and the reason why I say the philosophy is that I used with au pair in America is my au pairs was that prevention is the best policy. Mm. So if I can foresee um, anything and prepare people with expectations, um, that's the best way to do it. So mm -hmm. I would navigate and coach my families, selecting the best au pair for your family, selecting, um, uh, helping to train that au pair and prepare the au pair for success. Mm. So in a way, we kind of do the same thing with a buyer and a seller is pre preparation, expectations, and setting them up for success. So yeah. um, I kind of use the same philosophy. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's that I think is a major differentiator between what we think of as real estate experts and professionals versus those who might be like dabbling in real estate or exactly. maybe just haven't been mentored or trained to develop that expertise because perhaps they're being thrown leads and they're just kind of like running and being door openers more than being educators and consultants and able to really advisors. lay the groundwork. Yeah, advisors. It's a great word. So I I I believe and I would say that a lot of my au pair families would agree with what I say when I say that I became a trusted advisor mm -hmm. over the 10 years of experience working with young women, working with the families. And I do hope to portray that as well with my families and even some of my families that were au pair families became my clients. I can imagine. And yeah. Not, you know, not the huge numbers, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter right. um, it, because it, it also became hard for them to see me as a, a not an au pair coordinator, oh, but, a, yeah. but a real estate agent. So that, that was tricky navigating that. But, um, but the whole, the whole idea of being an expert versus an amateur um, I think the market over the last few years has made people think how easy it is to be a real mm -hmm. estate agent and how uh, houses sell themselves mm -hmm. or, you know, it's just paperwork, mm -hmm. right? And you just fill in the forms. Yeah. But there's a huge difference between filling out a form mm -hmm. and navigating and advising your clients on what's the best option. Right. Or what are your options? Yeah. Because the form is not a uh, one size fits all. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of different options and we have to, you know, work with the market as it is and yeah, try really to navigate um, accordingly, but you yeah. sell houses do not sell themselves right. even in a hot market. Right. And buyers can't buy by themselves, at least currently, because they are usually required to know a little bit about real estate mm -hmm and the forms and the laws and the, and the requirements, like you said, of each state, you know, or DC being a city, Virginia and Maryland. So. Yeah. I think an interesting point that you just made is 
having people understand all their options, especially buyers. And I think that might be something that gets a little bit lost on the buyer population as a whole, especially people who kind of cavalierly think that they don't need representation or can represent themselves or go with, you know, perhaps a discount brokerage or something like that. And they don't realize because they just don't know what they don't know, what they could be losing. Correct. And a lot of times that's just plain dollars that they're that they're losing that they don't even know that they could be saving by choosing to work with an expert who can lay out all of the options for them. Sometimes it's negotiating power. Sometimes it's access to properties that they never exactly. even would have seen. So exactly, you yes. make a really, really good point about that. Um, I want to ask you about something you said earlier on, which was like you were feeling when you started getting into real estate and capital, though, there were some established agents there. Yes. And that was a little intimidating. Yes. And the reason I want to ask you about this is this is something that I often get from audience members, listeners who email me and say, because they know that I do, you know, geo farming and they want to break into a farm Mm -hmm. and they're like, but there's this agent or there are these agents there and they already do everything or they do whatever. Mm-hmm. What would you say to an agent who has that kind of self-limiting belief? Interesting that you say that. So one of the best pieces of advice that I got when I joined KW in 2016 was um, I mentioned that intimidating factor to one of the team leads there. And they, and I, and they said to me, there's enough real estate for everyone to mm, work. Yep. There's plenty of houses to sell mm-hmm. and plenty of buyers out there. Yeah. I would say right now <laughs> the market is a little different. That was mm-hmm. 2016. Mm-hmm. But the market goes through ebbs and flows all the time. Yeah. But even in an ebb and flow situation, there are plenty of homes to sell. Yeah. People think that real estate agents are in constant competition with each other, but honestly, um, it's a choice that you make. If you want to be in competition with everyone, you can be in competition, but you can also be part of the community. Right. And you can just m- m- be a part of the community and help your community and serve your community. So that's really been my philosophy since the beginning is um, I'm here to serve buyers. I'm here to serve sellers mm-hmm. with the best service possible. Mm-hmm. And that's really what's my focus, not competition with other agents yeah. or trying to establish myself in front of another agent. Mm-hmm. It's not, that's not the goal. If they want to choose someone else, a, a seller or buyer, go ahead. That's, that's your choice. Right. Um, you know, there are lots of choices and hopefully I would differentiate myself as an expert. And if you want to choose me as the expert, you know, as someone who's willing to give you the best service and be a professional, then I'm here for you. Absolutely. And and make it, I think, about the relationship too, which you do so beautifully rather than about the transaction. Right. That's, it's such a key piece of it. Um, to the question about choosing a brokerage, that's the other one that I get yes. all the time because, you know, people are always like, oh, where are you located? And, you know, if they're not in the DMV, DC, Maryland, yes. Virginia, not the Department of Motor, for, Motor Vehicles, um, <laughs> then they go, well, you know, can you suggest, can you, and I really don't suggest what I do is I help right. people like explore the options and try to give them some things to think about that might help them find a match that's right for them. You mentioned support. Yes. You mentioned the ability to kind of do things the way, like if, by making a mark for yourself and doing it with some autonomy too, it sounds yes. like is important. Yes. What would you say to the agent who is maybe kind of in the same position that you were hungry, motivated, has some great experience in terms of either um, interaction with the public or contracts or something that's put them in, in the realm of something real estate adjacent perhaps, mm-hmm. and is trying to figure out like, what's the right fit for me? Yeah. Good question. Um, so the first thing I would do is to say, have the vision of what kind of agent you want to be first. Mm-hmm. You want to establish your identity as what kind of agent am I going to be? Because no matter what burgers you're with, you are establishing your own brand yep. and your own um, identity mm-hmm. as a real estate agent. And so you will need to decide to decide what kind of agent you want to be. Yeah. And then you want to look at you want to interview and see different brokerages and what they offer. Um, a lot of brokerages offer technology mm-hmm. and they say, you know, technology is really important. And that's the, and for me, that's not important. 
that that wasn't an important thing. And I get, you know, recruiting calls all the time. We have the best technology. I want to be able to show you. And I say to them, you know, I'm really not interested in, te- in the technology. I want to meet the people. And I've met people from our brokerage and I'm not interested in working with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I am really, what's really important to me is the team spirit and the community with which I want to be a part of yeah. because I am working with them every day. Um, and proximity is actually important to me. So moving, I moved from Capitol Hill to Montgomery County and uh, I realized I tried to keep that business going um, with my office downtown and it, it just wasn't, I was, I was not servicing everyone, um, especially myself and my family in the best way. So I needed to make a, a decision of proximity. Mm-hmm. And so proximity does make a difference. Yeah. Um, I would not uh, recommend, uh, you know, having it in another state or another jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Um, even if you are licensed in that jurisdiction, mm-hmm. I would recommend being in the same jurisdiction where you want to um, actually farm mm-hmm. or lead gen in that jurisdiction. But also um, the relationships that you're going to build. So if it really takes time to nurture and develop relationships with your community. So if you don't have time to dedicate to that community, then it probably isn't the right place to have your brokerage or your office. Um, There's a lot of factors with regard to brokerage and I may be making it more complicated, but um, that's why the decision to, 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 to choose a brokerage is important. Yeah. Um, I really don't think the national brand matters. I don't think that that, I I don't, I don't, I don't, half the time people don't even know what brokerage you're with in terms of a national brand. Um, With, you know, the online platforms now, people don't need to search Mm -hmm. on a branded search page. They work more with agents than they do a brokerage. Yes. So, yes. Exactly. And I also think that, and this is one of those things when I moved for the first time from a big box brokerage who kind of brainwashed us a little bit that yes. if the, the reason we were successful was because of the their brand. signage and their yeah. brand. And when I made that change, that's when those like scales were revealed from my yes. eyes. When all the agents were like, you know, the clients were like, we didn't even care who you were with it. Oh, we hired you. Yeah. And I was like, oh, but, um, I also think it gives you more longevity in your career because we see like these companies, they get bought by other companies, their branding changes. So I think, you know, you consider yourself, your own business, your own brand. That's right. That's the way to really differentiate yourself and to create create those long lasting relationships with your clients. Um, The other thing, and you made a really interesting point about proximity. So I was just um, listening to something yesterday that said that 68% of clients choose their agents due to proximity. Interesting. So that can be, and often is, physical, like geographic proximity can be mental proximity too. Like you're the person that happens to be in front of them when they're ready to make that decision. But if you are both the person who makes, who's in front of them when they're ready to make a decision to buy or sell, and you are the go-to person in the neighborhood, yes. the county, the city, whatever, they're much more likely to choose to work with you. And Correct. it gives you like an automatic leg up in comparison yes. to any other agent. Well, how many times do you hear, and you, Meredith, I'm sure hear this quite a bit, and um, and I hear it now that I'm with, oh, Meredith is everywhere. Yes, I see I Meredith see you everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> That's the agent so, you want to be. The agent that's who the people agent say, you want to be. I see you everywhere. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank so. you for that. Um, and interesting too, I'd be so intrigued to know what the statistic of this is because since the pandemic, there has been this oh, yes. kind of like blossoming of um, brokerages yes. that have no brick and mortar whatsoever. That have no brick and mortar. Yeah. Yep. And therefore, there's nowhere for agents to go and conduct their that's business. Right. And there's, I have to think that the synergy that is lacking for yes. those agents, not just being around people who are doing the business, you pick up things when you like hear people on phone calls or, you know, it's so different, right? I equate that a little bit with um, like the kids during the pandemic, yes. they felt like they needed to be on social media in order to mm-hmm. socialize with their friends. Well, no, we don't, that's not real socialization or 
that's not actually building a community and having yes. friends. Friends on social media are not your friends. So true. <laughs> agents on social media are not your agents. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Mic drop right there. <laughs> Those agents, they're, you know, they have their brand and they have their clients and they all of that. But um, the distance between you on, on the screen and in person is very different. Yeah. It's, it's so big. Yeah. So you know, kids need to be in person with their friends. They need to hang out with them in person yes. and see their face and yes. hear their laugh. And just um, kids need that. And mm-hmm. and I, I saw my kids needed it and I needed it um, during the pandemic. Yeah. But I think that, um, you know, there is a, there is maybe some benefit to having access to um the tools that agents need virtually. And that's one thing, sure. but you also need to be in person and yes. and social media or virtual learning. If you want to equate virtual learning with virtual business, it just doesn't work. Yeah. It, it is not, um, it is not beneficial. It doesn't create social um, communities. It doesn't com- create a community spirit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of having um, in-person meetings, in-person schooling, Mm -hmm. in-person casual getting together too. So completely agree with you. I think it's, it's vitally important and even little things like the way that you present yourself, getting back to that, you know, professional versus amateur expert versus amateur. When you bring a client into a brick and mortar space where there is a dedicated conference room and there's clearly like a receptionist area and all of that, People all of a sudden elevate the way that they think of you as a professional versus trying to do a buyer consultation over like a kitchen counter in somebody's house that you're showing or in the you know, back of your car or at Starbucks Correct. or whatever. It's and people get it. People see like Ooh, she doesn't have an office if you're she, a she ta- they take you seriously. Yes. It's a exactly. serious um, you know, anyone can throw up a website, anyone can mm-hmm. throw up a, you know, a Google business profile. Yep. But not everyone can have an office in the Kentlands or, you know, on Capitol Hill and just and and be able to walk in the door and say, hey, I need a real estate agent. Exactly. Exactly. I want to take you back to another thing that you mentioned, which was being a mom. Mm -hmm. So when you got started in real estate, your kids were were little, right? Well, let's see. My youngest would have been my oldest would have been 10. My youngest would have been uh, five. Okay, so young kids, three. Three. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay. So, and you really hit the ground running, it sounds like, with relatively small kids at home. And this is another question I get all the time from listeners is, can you give me like a slate of tips or advice about how I can bring balance? Like that's that magic word that I don't really think exists <laughs> to my, my life and my work and make sure that I'm not, you know, ignoring my children and um, hampering the development of my family while I burgeon ahead on this real estate career what advice would you give well so um let's see the reason why I became a real estate agent was um the goals and and dreams that I had for my kids so the Mm -hmm. my whole purpose is for being a real estate agent is for my family so I can't very well leave them to to the you know aside Mm -hmm. as I'm pursuing the dreams for them so having your purpose and your mindset very clear why are you doing real estate is yes. very important Absolutely. so um just to say that up front um you know um being an au pair counselor was just not cutting it in terms of many reasons but also it was more and more demands on my time actually mm, um the more families that i had to supervise and coordinate it was actually worse for my family. So, um, so again, putting the purpose of helping my family and putting that first is, is really important. Um, how did I manage it? I didn't balance it because I agree that word is not the best mythical. It's mythical. It's (laughs) like, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, you know, a scale, right, uh, you know, I'm right. not trying to balance anything yeah. um, or a juggler. <laughs> um, I, I honestly have to say that um, it was a lot of uh, trial and error and mm-hmm. um, 
trying to figure out how to do it um, for the first couple of years. So it wasn't perfect. And it wasn't like I had a formula. And I think every family has to figure that out or every yeah. real estate agent does. Um, I, you know, I speaking to more real estate agents, I think they all have the same issue of like, okay, who takes the kids while I go sh- to a showing? Who, t- yeah. who does this? Yeah. Who takes the kid to this uh, sporting event while I go to an mm-hmm. open house, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's, you just do it. It's not a, it's, there's no, like, you know, luckily my husband is around on the weekends. He doesn't have a weekend job. He has more of a Monday through Friday, you know, job. So luckily that's, that's how we balance it is, is really having one that's not a weekend or afternoon job. And the other, you know, I, I'm flexible to go do um, what I need to do. Love I don't that. know how my kids would say that I balanced it. <laughs> Maybe in a couple of years, I'll ask them and see how they felt. But, you know, they've definitely been, have, have you know, spring market is usually very busy and yeah. most weekends I'm not available. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working. Right. So um, I have my mother-in-law who's my most fantastic supporter uh-huh. who helps with my kids on the weekends and she still does in, in her eighties. Wow. And, um, and my husband and I can say, you know, there are people who do it alone, but I, I don't know who they are because I, I can't do it alone. Yeah. I think it's hard to do alone. And I think, you know, to your point, whether you have that kind of like built in support system in terms of a spouse or a partner or a family member, you do have to kind of rely on yes, a little do. bit of a village if you're yeah. going to be successful in this career. And also I think realizing that you are setting a phenomenal example for your children I for hope. setting goals, being purpose-driven, yes. as you said, achieving and showing them what is possible Yes. when you put your natural skill set, your talents, your abilities, yes. and your passion together, like what kind of alchemy that can create. It's Correct. Amazing. And also I'm at the point now where my, I have a teenager who can come and help me. Yes. And I set that example of saying, this is the way we do things. Yes. You know, I will be down on the floor, scrubbing the floor and getting all the little spots off the floor. Yep to get this listing ready yep. and you will be helping me water the lawn yep. every day after school and, you know, until it goes in the morning you know, mm-hmm. between the, when it's sold and on the, you know, closed. I mean, there's, there's little things that they help me with along the way. And, yeah. um, and my little, you know, preparing the little chocolates for my open house, yes. my, my, <laughs> my 11 year old will, you know, help me with them and help himself as well with them. So, <laughs> so he's getting a little bit of reward he's doing both. right away. That's good. I love that. And I think that's, that's brilliant too, that you're bringing them in and giving yes. them like a little bit of a stake in the business as well. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's again, one of those things that as the kids get older, they come back and they, they see how important it is yes. and how they can be that's right. A significant in contribution to, which is like another brilliant lesson. Correct. Them. And to be professional. And the, yes. and the standard of, of how we do things. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I love that you said that too. That was something I used to always say to my kids. Like when you were just reminding me of scrubbing the floor, <laughs> my kids would say, like CJ would go, nobody does this. And I'd be like, uh, that's not the way we, like, people don't do things like this. And I was matter. like, and I said, well, this is how we do. Things. That's right. It doesn't and matter. I always said that. And they used to say like as kids, nobody does that. Nobody does that. And you know, that's not the way people do things. I'm like, this is the way we do things. This is the way we and do always things. we're going to hold matter. ourselves to a that's different right. standard. And again, I think that's, that's so good. That speaks very yeah. highly to them. Yeah. Yeah. Leaves an impression. Doesn't necessarily mean they've carried that standard into their independent mm-hmm. lives now, but well, man, wait. I'm hoping they come Someday back. Someday it will. Someday. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Now I want to ask you about your transition into being an agent mentor sure. as you are continuing to be a top producer. So sure. what was it that made you feel like being a mentor might be something in your, in your future? Well, um, prior to moving to DC and becoming a, men- a real estate agent and becoming a mom, I was a teacher and I taught, um, um, you know, I taught and I really enjoy teaching. Um, both of my parents were teachers. Oh, it comes okay. very natural to oh. me. Um, so I enjoy helping others and teaching others. I enjoy sharing information. I enjoy sharing, um, the tools that, that have helped me along the way 
so that someone else doesn't have to struggle mm. like I did. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying I struggled terribly. It's not a huge struggle, but I'm just saying you shouldn't have to struggle as much. Yeah. Maybe that's what brought me to also have my own. You you have to struggle. Everyone has to struggle, you know, yeah. a little bit mm-hmm. to be able to find your way. And like I said about finding your identity and finding your way, um, no one can build your business for you. It's your business. You own it. You take it, you take it into your hands and you build it. And so being a mentor is just giving sort of a leg up, you know, it's not like, um, I'm building your business for you or trying to make you do the business. Like I do it, Mm -hmm. but more, if this tool will help you, this is what helped me. Maybe it'll help you. So, um, a mentor is meant to do that. It's Mm -hmm. just, be an example, be a model and show other agents what works for you. But ultimately, you know, I want to give the freedom to the agent to be themselves, Yeah, you know, to find their own way because Mm -hmm. they will not build their business if I build it for them. Right. It will not, it will not go anywhere because it's not my business. Right. It's theirs. Right. So taking ownership of your own business is really important. So if I'm just giving them some tools to help them, I mean, ultimately you can only do so much. One person can only do so much. And if you don't have your systems in place, um, you will limit yourself. Yes. So if I'm going to do more business, I have to have my systems in place. I mean, keeping, I remember at one point I had four, or five contracts under four, five contracts under contract at once. And I thought I was going to, ex- my mind was going to yeah, You just said you're not a juggler. Like, so. I'm not a juggler. <laughs> exactly. I'm not a balancer. Um, and I didn't have a transaction coordinator because mm. I, I'm not a fan of, of actually handing off my responsibilities yeah, yeah. to someone else, even though those are transaction coordinators are very helpful. It just depends on how you want to run your business. Right. But, um, but I needed a way to manage it all. So mm-hmm. I have come up with my own systems and I use those to um, keep myself, my contracts in check and all of that. And I want to share that um, with my mentees and help them to come up with their own systems. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And I think to your point before about, you know, brokerages who are like, oh, we have all this technology, right? What we know is the best technology is the technology that you will actually use. That's right. So when you are presenting the options, kind of like you present the options to your clients, right? That's With right. your mentees, you're presenting a slate of options and That's tools right. that they can use. They figure out which one feels like the best fit. Which one will they use? And which one will they actually use, right? Yes. Now, I mean, things can evolve. You know, sometimes, yes. I mean, man, I started with an Excel spreadsheet, you know? Yes and Outlook as my reminder system. And now I use follow-up boss. So, and that's through lots of iterations and evolutions of of tech. There will be. Yeah. So I think it's plugging into those things first, like you said, so you don't limit yourself and so that you are avoiding that roller coaster ride that so many agents go on where they get so inundated with all the tasks of doing the business because they're not systemized. And then they fall off on their lead gen and then they have to ramp way back up again to get back into productive action. So that helps to avoid that piece of it. Right. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, you're you're obviously such a great mentor. So well, a little story about you for one second here. We were at um, our sales meeting this week, last week, I guess it was. And one of our new agents who had not been like matched with a mentor yet, just naturally gravitated to you. And I can see why you have such like a welcoming, just, you know, very, very um, warm kind of an energy that you exude. And so she came right up to you and she was like, can you be my mentor? <laughs> and you guys are off and running already. Yeah. But I still see that in you. You, you um, Obviously with your clients, you are able to help them understand your level of expertise and trust and with new agents as well. How important do you think it is back to that selection of a company to work with that there is some kind of a mentor system in place if you're brand new? Well, that's like, oh, if you're brand new. Yeah. Yeah. I find that that's key. Yeah. Um, I I really think that what, well, what your team offers, honestly, is very, uh, it's not found in mm. many places, yeah. unfortunately, right. anymore. Um Having a mentor in your first couple of years is really important, but a mentor who actually has time 
to yes. listen and ask patience. Right. And um, it's it's really key, and I highly recommend it. It's worth putting. I mean, I put in two years without a mentor learning the ropes and making mistakes and mm-hmm. um, didn't have a mentor. Mm-hmm. And I can't imagine if I had had a mentor, if it, if that would have been a lot shorter, that, that period of learning. Yeah. Um, I think if you, if you invest in a mentor, um, you will become successful. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And I was sort of in the same boat. I went, I think my first, like about two and a half years without a mentor, just, you know, soaking up everything I could yes. from group training and classes and trying to like and listen then, to what yeah. other people were doing. But when I got with that mentor, that was the transformation in my business. Because like you said, she cared, she listened, she understood my goals. She asked great questions, showed me tools that I wasn't aware of. And from there, you know, being part of a coaching ecosystem too has helped with that on a different level. Right. But when you're new, the nice thing about this coaching can be really expensive. When yes. you're new, the investment you're making is usually mostly with your time, mm-hmm. but you are creating, you know, a split structure typically, at least that's how we do it here. Sure. And you're not paying anything up front. Yes. You're paying from your split. So exactly. you're success is where you start to to feel that um that traction happening and it feels less like you're expending money for something that's not exactly mess, not coming back immediately it's a great model because um the mentor then has a stake in how well true. you do yeah that's so true. um i want you to be successful you want to be successful and we're working together towards that yeah um patience is required if you want to be a mentor um i'm I've got an, not an unlimited amount of patience, but I do have a lot of patience, maybe more than most people. But um, I think that you also have to have patience as a realtor. Yes. You have to invest in yourself, training, you know, going to meetings, you know, attending your, your, continuing education classes, learning that it's an investment in your knowledge and in your expertise. And as we know, being an an expert versus an amateur is what will bring you clients and sales and transactions closed because there are lots of amateurs out there, but there aren't a whole lot of experts. Mm. That is a great way to end the show. I think we're already after our our 30 minutes, but man, it was, it was so worth it to go a little bit longer and to hear all of that. And that was a a beautiful wrap up. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being with us on the list and being an amazing mentor. If people want to reach out to you, they have a house to buy or sell in Maryland, DC or Virginia, want to know more about how you can help them about, you know, how you as how you have uh, developed your mentoring business, or if they're a brand new agent, have questions, what's the best way, way for them to find you? They can find me on Instagram at Ask Agent Anne, or they can find me on the List Realty page. Um, they can also find me uh, on Facebook at Ask Agent Anne Realtor. So I'm I'm Lots here. I'm I'm here for your questions. Awesome. Here for your your real estate challenges. I'm here. Thank Every, you. Everything is figure outable is what I uh, what I say. We can figure it out. Absolutely. Together. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for listening. I know you've enjoyed this one. This has been a great wealth of information. So thank you again. If you're interested in finding more out about Anne, follow her and reach out. She's happy to answer questions. If you're interested in learning more about The List Realty, you can find us also on Instagram, Facebook, all of the social media channels. And if you're interested in learning more about real estate geo farming, pick up a copy of Farming for Real Estate Agents available on Audible and anywhere books are sold. So thank you again. Thank this you, has been, Thank you. This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We'll see you next time. We are so grateful you joined us today. If you've benefited from the advice we share on the show, we hope you'll tune in to our next episode. Interested in learning more about my personal mentoring programs, our career kickstart course, or to pick up a copy of my book, Farming for Real Estate Agents, your step-by-step guide for becoming the go-to agent in your local market, visit www.meredithfogel.com and click the resources tab. If you are curious about becoming part of the List Realty family of agents, go to the www.thelistrealty.com website and click Careers from the About Us page. Or find me at the Meredith Global Team on social media. Thank you for listening.
This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We'll see you next time.